Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 46 of Tales of Tamriel. I am your host, Agelos, and with me this afternoon, she who's been away on assignment with the Dark Brotherhood for many, many days. Also, she who feeds on your tears, Thaise. How are you doing? Um, I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad to be home. You know, it, it was cold outside, killing all kinds of people for the Dark Brotherhood. So sure. Glad to be home. Miss my kitties. Right, your little Khajiit, the one sitting here on the desk at the moment. He's the best one. And here comes the other one. That one sucks. I see. Now, what did you come home to this week? Um. Come on now. Oh, uh. oh, I came home to a wonderful present. They, you know, although they, they kind of look like, what did I say they looked like? They look like ticks. Yes, they look like ticks. I came home to a mud crab pet. Oh, the, the plushie. The plushie. I got my plushie too. I did. I came home to a mud crab plushie, but as I'm looking at it, I'm like, "Wow, it really looks like a tick." <laughs> <laughs> other than That's... the front crab, uh, yeah, other, than, other than the claw thingies, it just looks like a giant plush tick. Are you describing <laughs> Ag or the pet? Oh, a little bit because he's kind of ticky too. Oh, that's that's not cool. <laughs> Oh, well. Also joining us, the man with the plan and 100 ESO guides, but doesn't actually even play ESO, Deltia of Deltia's Gaming. How are you today, good sir? What's this ESO you're talking about? I don't know. I mean, apparently... People play a game know, called Elder Scrolls. ZeniMax doesn't think you're good enough with guides. So. Oh, they're hating on me. I love you, ZeniMax. That's fine. I know. Picking on you? Picking on you? It's All good right, day please. to be alive. Good day to be alive. What, what are you playing today while for the people in the stream? We're actually playing Dragonstar Arena. So for people that want to see it, we're doing normal mode. Um, yeah, got a good group together. We're just going to put around and do that. So it should be a good time for you guys who haven't maybe seen this content. Nice. Awesome. Also, we have a special guest this week, the founder of Tamriel Foundry. I almost got a little tongue tied <laughs> there. Uh, and guild leader of Entropy Rising, Atropos. How are you today, good sir? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on the show. It's great to stop by and chat with y'all. Oh, wonderful. I'm really glad that we actually got you on here. I've been a fan of uh, your website and all the stuff you've been doing probably since I first found out about it. and That was a very, very long time ago. He's an Atropos awesome. fanboy. Awesome. I am an Atropos fanboy. I'm, I'm touched. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's great. It's, it's, you know, interacting with folks like you guys in the community that was really one of the reasons I wanted to do it, so... Excellent. Now, I'm really happy. I do have a question, though. Not not just for you, but for Delty. I'm going to call him out here at the same time. So, Delty, you're now with Entropy Rising, right? Yeah. So, do you use FTC? Oh, yeah. It's like yeah, mandatory. Yeah. He, he'll, like, check your screen. He'll say, give me I a screenshot. Know, I, for a while there, I noticed you weren't using it. What are you talking about? I use it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can look back on some of your past streams there. No, right? I've always used it. Cloud Combat I use for the notifications, so stop uh -huh. calling me out. God, <laughs> call me out in front of my guild leader. Look That's at that. That's what I was trying to do. <laughs> Kipster and I were making fun of you the one day we were looking at him like, he's running with Entropy Rising and he doesn't use FTC? Ooh. Oh my god, I, guys. <laughs> this is why I don't stream anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it. I had to do it. All right. Well, I want to thank you guys for joining us. This is going to be a fun show. Let's go ahead and move right on into the game news. First up, since we didn't do it last week because Thais was away, we had no Lore Master Archive. Undaunted. Ooh. A life of glory. Ooh. So you have to do the chant there, Thais. You remember the chant? Isn't it just undaunted? <laughs> undaunted. Yes. We are undaunted. <laughs> yes, that is, that is right. <laughs> so they came out with another one of these Lore Master Archives for anyone who hasn't read it. And there's actually, uh, let's go ahead and I'll have you read The Undaunted, A Life of Glory. Okay. For Taruk Redclaws. There are those who choose to fight for honor and justice. Some who bloody their swords for coin. And then there are others. <laughs> others who crave danger, like this one. When brothers and sisters still mewed and cowered under mother's skirts, Taruk conquered the tallest shelf in the kitchen, only to pounce on her head when came to bake the sugar biscuits. Since those early days of tiny, fiery courage, my exploits have become much more ambitious. As a founding member of the Undaunted, this one's noteworthy accomplishments should be recorded. And how better to describe them than with his own claws? 
This one was never destined was never destined for the sugar fields, despite Mama's pleas. The thrill of risk and peril called, and brothers and sisters found joy in devising ever greater dares, a practice that got your hero Red Claws in trouble more than a few times. The life of digging and planting and chomping chopping could not match the rush of poking a sleeping senshi tiger with a stick and running or any of the other wild challenges that gave such a surge of excitement. In the end, it was too much for my dearest mother to handle. It was not good for her poor heart, the constant worry over broken bones and smaller, minor consequences of budding heroism. She signed poor Turuk away to apprenticeship in the Fighters Guild as soon as they would allow. Happily, this turned out to be a reasonable arrangement for some time. With, with them, this one trained with many weapons and learned the basics of the adventuring life. Alas, it was not long before boredom began yanking at the tail. The Fighters Guild had so many tedious rules and regulations and took so much caution with jobs that they sucked the fun right out of any contract. No, no, Taruk, you cannot take on a cave of frost trolls by yourself armed with only a butter knife. It is unwise. Taruk, you mustn't run so much in the dungeon. There could be traps. Make sure you bring enough healing potions. Bah! Milk stop blubbering. Armed with training and an insatiable hunger for greater danger, this one struck out on his own path, wandering Tamriel from Dune to Windhelm and chasing beasts from farmers' legends and local rumor. No cave or ru no cave or ruin was too frightful, from nests of necromancers to the lairs of mighty beasts. These very claws ended Grush Grush, the deadliest ogre known in the provinces, and dealt the final blow to Spine Snap, the giant snake that plagued the fields of Glenumba and devoured goat and horse alike. The list goes on and on. Perhaps this one shall write another volume just for these tales. It was through these journeys that this one met a few others with the taste for taking on the greatest challenges without flinching or hesitation. Of these like-minded comrades, only mighty Mordra and Kalsting the Axe could truly keep up. They knew of many dangerous locales, and we dared each other to challenges most deem utterly insane. Take the naked dungeon run, for instance. <laughs> Tales of our deeds began to spread, and others sought us out. The Undaunted were born. First off, I think that was the uh, most energetic you've ever done a reading, period. <laughs> Like, ever. He sounded so excited. Well, obviously, he does naked dungeon runs. Well, that's why I did it that way. I like it. Okay. And well, second off, number two, don't mean to interrupt you there, uh, Nibbling in the chat says, it was a shame when Zenimax changed the Microsoft Sam voices for the Undaunted. It's Nibbling. Sam. <laughs> Nibbling. You'll offend him. <laughs> I will offend him. That's okay. Um, yeah, Microsoft Sam. That's the robot voice for We Are Undaunted. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> they literally just had the, yeah. They actually redid those, I was going to say. It's a weird chant. It just, I don't. I don't know. Dave, you're <laughs> just a hater. You're, you're a hater. Hater and Over a hate? there. Now you just made me think of Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I said I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> Great, thanks, Ian. It's all going to be thinking about the entire Taylor show Swift. is Taylor Swift. All right, this is not a Taylor Swift song. All right, there's some questions here we'll answer real quick. There's three of them here. All right, I have a question in regards to the Undaunted Guild. More specifically, the size of the guild. Is it true that the Undaunted was once a large guild with a membership rivaling that of the Fighters and Mages Guild combined? Taruk Redclaws says... This one does not know how many members the Fighters and Mages Guild boast. Though, Turuk has heard they possess a much higher retention of new recruits. Let them have it. Life is easier for mercenaries and lunatics and dresses. No offense to mercenaries and lunatics and dresses. <laughs> the Undaunted have many of those. As to your specific question, membership in the Undaunted waxes and wanes like the moons. In fair weather, there is always a surge of interest from hot-blooded youth as well as the infirm. They come looking for adventure or an honorable way to pass on and come in droves, perhaps because the Fighters Guild won't accept the very old or very young. But the Undaunted are happy to oblige them. In an early rain's hand, Taruk personally vouches for dozens, dozens of recruits who passed their initial trials. Then, as the year marches on, 
Those numbers are eviscerated by Tyrael's dark depths. Unfortunate, but it is in those depths that true undaunted are forged. Taruk's friend Talis just pointed out that Taruk still hasn't answered your question. That one thinks she is too great. Looking around, Taruk sees... Give Taruk a moment to count. Taruk sees five. Five undaunted. Taruk never counts the rest as alive until he confirms it with his eyes. Is that more or less than the combined might of the fighters and mages killing? Taruk may never know. It occurs to Taruk perhaps this would have been a better question for Mighty Mordra, who keeps a superior headcount. I like this character. <laughs> I, I really do. So, I first met you. You've taught me several helpful things but I still feel that there's more I could learn from you. Some sort of ultimate knowledge, a technique perhaps, I like how they're doing this, that would help my allies and me while we investigate Tamriel's dungeons. Have you thought about letting us into, <laughs> or letting us into such a secret someday? Taruk would like to say that he remembers the illustrious Lady Moonshine, but Taruk lives in taverns and sadly does not. He hopes you were not one of the one of the ones he taught blood altar construction to while under the influence of drink. Those poor souls will spend the rest of their lives wishing they could forget that night, and Taruk is still picking hideous crust out of his ears. As for new techniques, the Undaunted are forever refining their skills, but it is difficult to improve on the basics. It sounds like you have learned everything the Undaunted have to teach. Except, perhaps, that success in the depths isn't about techniques. It's not even about the weapons you carry into battle. It's about shrewdness, yours and your friends. Besides, you already know how to make a blood altar. What more do you need? The blood altar fixes all of Taruk's problems. It's becoming an issue. I like the roleplay answer to, are you ever going to make an ultimate for Undaunted? <laughs> That's what that was. Undaunted 10, <laughs> baby. It's coming. It's coming. I don't know. I like those passives, which we may have to... I love random, the passives. They're awesome. Question of Tropos, here's, here's something for you, because I know you're a number cruncher. The passive that gives you bonuses for having one of each type of armor on, is that better to have that? Or do you think it's better to roll with one full set of armor? I think he's muted. Argon. <laughs> well... I'll take I over. Even... Oh, there you go. Totropos, you're back. Oh, yep. no, no. Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's weird. My uh, Skype, I, I'm out of habit. I use my push to talk button, but uh, the button, which is push to talk in Skype, is push to mute. So <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's a little confusing. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's a tricky question. I think it depends a lot on, um, on the build that you're running. Uh, for tanking, I think there's an argument to be made for running one piece of light armor, uh, if not more than one, because there's some good synergy with the the uh, light armor passives in terms of spell resistance, magicka regeneration, and then you can get uh, a boost to your overall pools if you sort of mix in a piece. But I think for um, stamina users who are going with the melee crit route, it's really hard to sacrifice uh, sacrifice a, a piece of medium armor. Same for, for DPS. So I don't know. I'm, I think it's nice that they're trying to get people to hybridize, but I'm not sure it's quite good enough to, to get people to do it just yet. Except for maybe maybe tanks. Okay. Delty, how about you? What do you think? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, the passes are so important, but you get a lot of... A lot of uh, if you do three three pieces, that's six percent with both passives. So that's a lot more health, magic, and stamina. But like I said, I've tried it on my tank, and I just prefer two light, five heavy right now. It just seems the most most advantageous for me. Though you know, a lot of people do different things, and there's people tanking serpent with all light. You know, so just gotta this just depends on what your what your group comp is really, and who's responsible for you know keeping you up and doing that sort of thing. But self heals if you can self heal got to have some light armor to cast that once in a while sure all right interesting i was just kind of curious what you guys thought about those passives because when they first came out i know there was a lot of talk about like wow six percent extra to your, all your stats i think that may be more useful when update six comes out and they do the uh, times 10 for all of the stats so six percent might actually mean a little more than it does right now well the other passives way better which is the synergies restore basically everything Mm -hmm. so it's really changed the meta of the game like you know 
luminous shards or the shards the Templar has, well, now it's really important to hit that. Even Purify, if I'm about to die and I have no stamina, I'll just hit that so I get 100 stamina back. You know, that saved my life just using one synergy. So I think it's changed the game a lot. Okay. All right, we'll move on. Final question here that was asked. What is the normal attrition rate for new bloods within the Undaunted? Taruk believes he has answered this question in some form or another before. But he has plenty of moon sugar tonight. The Undaunted recruit new bloods often. There have been a great many of them. Sva, the Saul Crenshaw, Severio, the full Nelsonius Nelsonius, Lex Pilper. So many of them were here and are absent now. Taruk swears he has non-imperial comrades who have passed on, but he can't remember them. Many ask Taruk when he says this. Why, then, do we never see them? They are around us always, in Taruk's heart. They are dead, but they are here. Hmm. All right. Well, that is the Lore Masters Archives, Undaunted, A Life of Glory. That's right. We're going to move on to the next bit of news, which is another Battlemaster corner, the Bastion of Night. With this, Deltia. Nightblade tanks. Should they just delete their characters and re-roll? No, I like my Nightblade tank actually now. I've had a lot of fun with it. Um, you don't have the big self-burst heal, but, I mean, Atropos can get away with it on a Sork tank and, you know, do just well. So um, his build, I think we were talking about it, Atropos, and TeamSpeak one night. It just seems like a solo build. Some of the abilities he has is more like geared towards doing your own thing where you have to heal yourself, you have to, you know, kill stuff, mm -hmm. you have to... So. Uh, it's just another build where people are trying to do too much, I think. Uh, you know, be a tank, be a healer, be a DPS. You're not going to be able to do it all. Now, leveling, you will. It's a whole different story while you're leveling. So, with that premise, I don't know what the build's intended for. Is it supposed to be, you know, trials ready type thing? Or is it supposed to be just dinking around? You know, we don't know that, I don't think, in this particular one. Um, right? We, they didn't say. I did not see anywhere on here that it says anything about it being an endgame build. He does attach a video at the end where he's messing around in Craglorn, so yeah. high-end questing area. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call that endgame, but, or at least solo endgame maybe, but not, uh, not hardcore stuff, but it is harder than the standard questing. Well, his... Uh... Good example. Oh, go ahead. I think a good a good analogy for this build is that, you know, with a sort of defensively oriented sorcerer with critical surge, you can go and solo uh, almost any, you know, any small group content in the game. And it's like a, a really strong setup, but that doesn't mean you'd be tanking trial bosses with critical surge. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think that it's kind of similar to that. This is like a really good build for just running around on your own and being very durable and being able to kill pretty much anything. I think it's a really strong build for that. And for some players, that's going to be really appealing. Um, doesn't not, not every tank build necessarily has to be a, a trial tank, but um, I like this one because it brings a lot of group utility, even if it doesn't necessarily bring the raw mitigation that like a pure tank would. Okay. Nice. Um, I was going to say, one of the things that I, I have issues with, and you guys can probably tell me if I'm right or wrong on this, but You're even wrong. looking at his stat... No, Deltia, you be quiet. <laughs> if you were right, Deltia, Zoss wouldn't have to make guides. Oh, burn, dude. <laughs> burn. Jeez, we're going there already? Yeah, I'd just drop that one. Drop the mic right there. Dang, I guess. <laughs> Love you, Deltia. <laughs> Hey, I follow your guides for my ult, so I'm not saying much. Well, I had to make a guide for so you could do some damage on your sneaking Templar. Hey, you still didn't do a two-handed weapon. You you have it as a backhand. I use it front, so... Them red circles, bro. Them red circles. I like them red circles. I know you do, playing on the I PTS, like the believe me. Circles. They're pretty. <laughs> um, Magicka, he's 32 points in Magicka, 30 in health. Now, he says, despite being a tank build, uh, we need almost no additional stamina thanks to spells and equipment. But when you look down through his his uh, through his spells and equipment that he has, he talks about using health enchants on his infused pieces and everything else magicka. I don't see where he's getting extra stamina from, and I think that would probably cause an issue with pretty much anything because he won't be able to block that much. Thoughts? Well, it's really siphoning strikes. Yeah. But 
the the issue with siphoning strikes is that you have to actually be attacking and i mean again this goes back to the sort of like small group or solo play style is that you can be attacking uh in order to generate those siphoning ticks to keep your stamina pool up but uh you know honestly in really end game content when you're tanking it you find yourself mostly uh blocking and just acting very defensively and not getting a whole lot of uh offensive action in but i mean i think this build would probably do okay as long as he packs in uh, some stamina regen on his uh, jewelry and, and uses the siphoning strikes to keep that pool up. Uh, I, I expect that would probably work okay. Thais, do you have anything you want to say about the build, or do you not care? Uh, it's a Nightblade tank. That, to me, is just derby. All right, but, but, you... but of course, I'm a purist. I think the Nightblade should be stabby, stabby, stabby. All right, stabby. This, is, this is so great that we have a Tropos on this show. Tropos, what's your build like? <laughs> Just give just get an overview because she believes a sorcerer should always be cloth and use uh, stays mm. no matter what. It's funny. So does Zenimax. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Well played. All right. Well, that joke didn't work out as well, but he really pulled that together for me. <laughs> All um, right. <laughs> no, oh. I'll, I'll be happy to talk about it a bit later. Yeah, but, we'll um... we'll talk about it. I just I, I like to pickle her because she's always one of those where. She's like, I, I play around on uh, my Dragon Knight alt, and I use a Delta Shooting Star build, and she's like, why are you wearing cloth and having a destruction staff? I'm like, I don't know. Cause she's like, you should be a tanker. On my Templar, I play my melee DPS. She's like, you should be a healer on my... Uh... I've never told you you should be a healer. You All should right. never be a healer. <laughs> you would be, would be the worst healer in MMA On history. my Sorcerer, I play dual wield, and she finds that <sighs> difficult. I heal on my Nightblade. <laughs> and I don't even care if it's bad. I just do it because when she looks over and cringes, it's worth it. I, I die a little inside. Look at my sorcerer. It's got a sword and shield and heavy armor. There's that snort again. <laughs> All right. We're going to move on to the next bit, which is the Tamara Chronicle issue number 75. Again, this is for those who don't know, they did separate out the podcast from the other types of fan art. So we are not on this one to this week, but they do have a lot of um, group events for the community, such as role play events. I got to say, this community is one of the most active role play communities I think I've ever seen. Like, there's freaking 20 events on here. I, that's an exaggeration, but there are a lot of events for role play within the community. I like this one. Soup kitchen, free clinic, and workshops in Fells Run. Those in need of a hearty meal or aid are encouraged to attend this event in the Run In Tavern, located in Fells Run. Volunteers are also welcome. Free clinic, huh? Yeah, that was that. That is what struck to me is, huh? That's interesting. Interesting. So when I die because you can't heal, that's where I'll go. All right. Okay. Awesome. Some of the fan art on here I really liked, specifically the Chibi Mar or uh, Debella. Face, what do you think about the Chibi Debella? That is so taking the spot of my phone background. <laughs> Aren't I your phone background? Not anymore. All right. Okay. Nice. And of course, there's your Argonian hugging an Altmer or a Bosmer, so that's a shame. Aww. This is one I really wanted to po point out for people who haven't seen it. You should go check it out. It is a gender bend cosplay of the, <laughs> yeah just knock my stuff out just let her sit on my lap next time i'm just gonna spray with water um gender ben cosplay of the breton it's a female doing it. that's why it's gender ben what do you think face i don't i don't understand why why you had to bring gender into it i don't understand because the main character was originally male and it's a female doing the cosplay oh, i think it looks better than the male okay all right well, that's that's how we're at. All right, if you haven't seen any of these things, you can check them out on the official Elder Scrolls Online page. Pretty cool stuff. Ark is asking you to link it. Oh, it's on the official page, Ark. I already closed it. I'm sorry. Sorry, Ark. Sorry. Next bit of news is the Cyrodiil population cap. And if you haven't noticed, uh, Delta and I, we did a little short video on Wednesday. I believe we up you uploaded it Wednesday, right? Uh, Yep. Yeah, um, haven't come up with a name yet, but it's where we talk about the little bit of news that happens throughout the week, just give you a short 10, 15 minute video. And we actually talked about Cyrodiil performance and population cap adjustments there. 
So if you'd like to hear our thoughts, you should check it out. It's on youtube.com slash gaming. Check that out. They're pretty cool. Pretty active in the comments, too. They're, how many comments did you have in, like, the first couple Oh, it was a, hours? It was a lot. bunch, yeah. We're, I mean, people are passionate about PvP. They have strong opinions one way against, for or against the forward camps and how PvP is supposed to be. I'm, you know, kind of the mi minority here on what people think it is and what it should be and stuff like that. And people are enjoying the no forward camps. I don't, but a lot of people are. All right. Um, Atropos. Did you see this post about them changing the population cap on Cyrodiil? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's really important for them to address because I think, um, you know, one thing that folks have have not really been thrilled about is the seeming sort of lack of progress of the PvP game. Like, there's been a lot of updates for the PvE side of the game, a lot of new content coming out, um... And I think that the PvP community is feeling a little bit like, uh, I don't know if they feel neglected, but, but maybe that Cyrodiil deserves a little bit more focus as well. And I, I think probably one of the absolute best changes they've made since launch is, is removing those forward camps, for example. And, you know, Delty and I take a different stance on this one. But um, I, I think in terms of the population, it's, you know, it's really important for them to make sure that Cyrodiil remains enjoyable for the people that are participating in it because that is their pvp end game that they have right now and, and until imperial city comes in and until the pvp side of justice system comes in you know cyrodiil is what what we've got for pvpers and so uh you know if reducing the uh campaign threshold uh will have positive impacts for performance so that the PvP that people are engaging in are uh, is going to be more enjoyable, then I'm all for it. I mean, I think right now, if you think about the game, we've got Thornblade that's like locked all the time. It's completely full, and then we've got a lot of ghost campaigns or buff campaigns. Um, and I, I think that everyone, I, I think a lot of people could have a lot more fun if we spread out the PvP population a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit less... Zergi and in, in Thornblade and, and a little bit more active activity in all the other campaigns I think would do a lot of good. We don't want Cyrodiil to turn into a ghost town though because it's a very large area and especially without forward camps it's important for people to be able to find action so it's a delicate balance. It is and I, I want to add to this as well. First uh, Angwar in chat from Tamriel Unchained he goes all this will change when the Imperial City comes out if you've lit, you should go listen to our video. I do not think Imperial City is the PvP messiah. I don't, because you know what's going to happen? People are going to go to their buff campaigns to do Imperial City. I, I, that's just how I think it's going to work. I really don't think there's going to be that much action around the Imperial City. Um, I could be wrong, but, I mean, that's how it works now. And, Atropus, you, you played Dark Age of Camelot before. I know that. The buffs, personally, I think are terrible in this game because they're almost required for PvE progression, which makes people not want to spread out in Cyrodiil because they need their buff campaigns. Like, there's an unspoken rule that this campaign is AD buff, this one is DC, and this one is EP, and they're dead 90% of the time um, because people need those buff campaigns. I think they just, if you want people to spread out among the campaigns, they need to change the buffs in general to make them not required for PvE, either by removing them outside of Cyrodiil or changing them to something like what Dark Age of Camelot had, which was like experience gain, gold drop, maybe percentage drop on rare items. I don't know, something along those lines to make it so it's not, doesn't affect your character stats as much. Ooh. Let me let me pose a question to you because I actually take, I, I agree partially with what you're saying, mm -hmm. and you know you're you're correct. I'm a huge, huge Dayak veteran, uh, and that to me was just an example of like a, a perfectly implemented uh, PvP system. Um, so I, I'm biased to to begin with here, but um, I'm not so sure that I think that the buffs themselves are badly designed. For me, what's badly designed is that ESO gives players the ability to just get those buffs without having to work for them. Because 
think about like what's the, the the fundamental difference between ESO and Dark Age is that you know Dark Age was a server based system. You were on your server, and the PvP, the the frontiers of your server, was what you were stuck with. You couldn't just say, oh well, you know this other server has free buffs, so I'm just going to pop over there to get my buffs, and then I'll PvP wherever I want. Like for me, the big problem is that it ESO just lets players, you know, have their cake and, and eat it too. And, and you should, I don't, I don't like that. I think players should be assigned to a campaign and you shouldn't be able to switch. Or, you know, if you do switch, it should be rare and expensive and it should really hurt you to switch. And players should be forced to be invested in their campaigns. Uh, I mean, I, I think that part of the problem is that you have the opportunity to just sort of mooch buffs. Right. I don't know. Does that make does that? No, I, I agree. It, that that is the problem because, as you said, how they designed it, everyone knows that these are buff campaigns. But if you were assigned, like when you're in there, you're assigned campaign three thousand two, and it's equal side, you're you're stuck. You can't move, and that's how you're assigned to it. Um, you would then be invested because you're like, well, if I want buffs, I'm gonna have to fight for them. Now it's not that way because you can just pick and choose or change whenever you would like. It well, seems all... like. It's it's there's so many related systems that contribute to the problem. I mean that's one piece of the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle is that PvP rewards are laughably bad. I mean they've been getting a little bit better with this in terms of the PvP bags and like giving players some good stuff. But you know, if you think about what are the incentives to PvP, the incentives to PvP in ESO is one, it's fun most of the time, so you're doing it for fun. But two. Uh, okay, you know what? I've run out of things. It's only one. It's just it's fun. So there's no there's no like character based incentives for PvPing. Yeah, sure, you've got you know the ten ranks of your alliance skill lines, but no one really, not many people really use those skills, and the people that care about those skills probably already have them. I mean, you compare that to a system like Dayok, where you've got realm abilities that you're progressing your character. All of a sudden, you care a whole lot more about PvP. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, people don't really care about it in ESO unless that is their thing. There's not really mechanics to draw people in. And the fact that, it you know, you let people just pop around to whichever campaign they want, it's it's all a bit soft, really. Sure. Well, it's, you were invested in a character in, in DOAC because RR11 took years to get. It was that was a that was a uh, real achievement when you got up there. You weren't even considered max level till you were RR5 because, quote unquote, level 51, that's where you really started doing your, you know, damage from all the buffs and stuff. Um, yeah, I don't, there's there's a lot with how they designed Cyrodiil and the way the game is designed in general. DOAC was specifically a PvP game. That was the end game. I mean, you had Dragon Raids and stuff like that and some of the Trials later on in Trials of Atlantis, which may or may not have been popular since they made a classic server but there were not a lot of things to do other than pvp this game seems to have a lot more things but they i don't know like you said they've made it too easy to get into get your free buffs yeah things yeah, need to change yeah. with pvp i think especially with that i i'm just not a fan of them affecting like the original trials times and stuff of those natures because not i play on evan heart pact you guys are ad and i feel bad for the dc players because they're not near as populous as ep is and we're only about half as much as ad it seems that if we didn't have buff campaigns you wouldn't have buffs well, I, I agree i agree completely with that i mean i have said for a long time that the minute you step into a timed trial your PvP buffs should fall off. See, that would be a good... Anything that has a leaderboard assigned to it, absolutely yeah, exactly. should not be Yeah, Anything affected. with a leaderboard. I mean, it's fine if you want your PvE buffs for, like, doing vet dungeons or whatever, but, like, sure. if you're doing something with a timed leaderboard... Anything that would be considered progression-type content should have it stripped. I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big circle, though, because you make that change, and then all of a sudden you're giving people even less reason to care about PvP. Like, the, the whole thing stems back to the fact that we need more reasons to care about PvP. 
And you know, if you if you take the the buffs out of the trials, then you know you're moving that in the opposite direction, which isn't helping things. But they just need to really rethink their game systems when it comes to getting people involved in Cyrodiil. And and you know, why do we fight? I, it you know, one of the biggest things that bothers me about ESO is that um, players have been trained to think about the alliances in ESO as uh, red, yellow, and blue. Like, how often do you see people calling them that? Uh, rather than referring them by like you know names or acronyms or something like faction pride or giving people reasons to you know hate the other team or to really get invested in their in their campaigns and their communities and develop like rivalries and, and alliances and stuff like that it, it's all being prevented from happening because pvp is just sort of only exists at face value at the moment sure well i hate all the elves period so that's fine I have plenty of rivalry with, with AD because Altmer suck. Stupid knife ears. Anyway, well, I mean that's perfect. That's that's what you want from your yeah. players. But I think most I think most folks don't feel as strongly about like you know representing their faction or really like feeling like they should be invested in the state of the alliance war. Um, I think I think you're outside the norm in that regard. I mean, I, I think that, you know, <laughs> when they when they opened up all the uh, races to all of the alliances, you know, that, that sort of was a silver bullet, I think, for, for some of the faction pride. But, you know, I, I guess I'm just bitter about that even after a year. But No, well. I, I understand that. And again, coming from the background we had, again, it being server-based, you couldn't even make... Uh, Albion or Midgard character if you were Hibernian on a server. You, you were locked to it. This game doesn't doesn't lock you in any way. My faction pride doesn't stem so much from the fact that I am the faction that I am. My faction pride comes from how much I hate everyone else in the other factions. That That is where mine stems from. Like, I hate the elves. I hate the orcs. Just so much hatred that it just makes me bleed for the pact well, for forever. You you go from a lore side of things, how you feel about the game and how they're... From a mechanic point of view, I mean, it doesn't matter where you get that faction pride from. Whatever your choice really is, that's great. But the problem is most people don't have it. They're like, yeah, I'm playing AD today. Oh, I'm playing DC today. Oh, I'm playing EP. It doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Okay. They don't really. Ha I, I've been a Nord since Morrowind. I I I was Ebonheart packed as soon as I saw where the Nords were. Because lore wise, I'm with them. I'm with them wherever they're at, and that's how it was gonna be. Um, but I still have my reason for faction pride. Plus, we have the coolest saying: "Blood for the pact." Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I I think, I think what you guys are saying is exactly what you want out of the game. And like, if you see a Khajiit, or if you see an an Altmer, or if you see uh, you know, an orc running around, you want to identify that person as an enemy. And that's, I think it's a shame that they got rid of that because the visual recognition of races is like, you know, this is the bad guy, this is the enemy, this is who, you know, I'm up against. I thought that was like a really valuable piece of the, the Dayok puzzle. And I was one, it was one that I was really glad they were replicating in ESO. So I was really sad when they, they got rid of that. I, I don't mind the... The, the, the cross faction races because there's always going to be that person whose ideals are different than where they were born and they're going to so we're the defect the, yes they're going to defect to somewhere else it happened happens in, in real life it happens so i like that that's an option i don't feel like it should be locked because then like, you're you're so much more narrowed in your choices. Yes, I guess it does kind of take away a little bit from faction pride that all the Khajiit aren't AD. But then a Khajiit that's on the Ebonheart Pact, I will honestly enjoy more than the utmost hatred I feel for Khajiit that are members of AD. Hmm. And I just, it's it's... I do. I, I enjoy that, that they give you the option to be like, oh, yeah, I love Ebonheart Pact, but, you know, I'm I'm a stinky Altmer. Like, it's a possibility. I'm stinky Altmer. I'm fine with this. <laughs> Again, it's coming from the lore background of the game, which is a very Elder Scrolls thing versus what they, they 
and obviously the people who made the game, most of them came from old Mythic Entertainment who made Dark Age. So that's why when the game was announced and we saw how they were doing it, we're like, oh, it's like all of the old yeah. Mythic team before EA came and destroyed it because I hate EA. Um, they, you know, they changed it. Now, they, they did away with only the people who pre-ordered the game still got that option, um, which I don't know. I guess it's one of those things where... The game, I feel, is growing, but so slowly that you're not seeing a mass of new players going, well, how in the world is that person a Khajiit? Because most of the people who bought the game early are still playing it. and they all. But there's not a lot of new players coming in going, I'm faction locked to this race. It was definitely okay. a trade-off. It was definitely a trade-off of, like, lore and the sort of... Elder Scrolls flavor of things is mm -hmm. a trade-off between that and gameplay in terms of like the mechanical benefits of having that very defined visual identification of who belongs to which and the the exclusion like the the um, a lot of things like what motivates you is sort of disliking other sides for what they have that you don't have like mm -hmm. you know being locked out of something sort of gives you a, a really natural human reason to dislike, you know, a, a different group. And I think that, you know, I understand why they made the choice from the lore-based and the Elder Scrolls-based perspective, but as far as, like, the cost of either side of it, I think the game would have not suffered very much from having faction-locked races, but I think it suffers a lot from having open ones. But that's, I mean, that's just my, my take on it, of course. Oh, understandable. I got you. Real quick, I don't know who Nibbling is, but I like him. <laughs> it's Nibbling. Nibbling. <laughs> Nibbling. I think his, his new name is going to be Nibbling. Nibbling? Nibbling. I, it, just, it looks like Nibbling. Nibbling. It, it, so that's, that's what I call him. It, it, all, every time I see that, all that reminds me of is I feel like it should be on a bag of grocery chicken nuggets. You know, Nibbling chicken nuggets. There you are. Sorry. Please don't be offended. <laughs> this character and two thumbs up. He's going to hate us now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not. All right. We're going to move on to the next bit of news. Deltia. Introducing Undaunted Pledges. Huh? That's right. Oh. <laughs> are you, are you, do you want to rant here or do you not want to rant? Well, I mean, so this community is fantastic and especially the community managers their guides are more like how to get started what's behind it not like basically reinventing the wheel and posting pictures of all the stuff so it really doesn't take anything away from me it actually adds a lot to it um so i'm thankful for that and you know i e emailed jessica to put something out about uh, a dragon star arena guide and she did it so i got way more views on people that hadn't even experienced the content and people thanking me that they could get it so i mean they just work so closely with people content creators like me i have there's no ill will towards them whatsoever and i think it's great getting people incentivized on undaunted and coming directly from them might have a better impact than coming from just you know me like a blogger type guy so sure I mean, I, just, I can't really stop raving is. about how good they are to me and uh, helping me get exposure. And uh, so I appreciate all they've done for me. And yeah, so th they've done, been fantastic to work with. <laughs> I, I, I like him. He says, I'm only offended by people who play moddable games on console. Yeah, Does that mean he likes the mod games on his PC? Yeah, it's okay. like people who play Skyrim on 360 instead of on the PC. No. Why? <laughs> Anyway, now th this is definitely one of those. It's kind of like the new player start here kind of thing. Yeah, I agree that even other games do these kind of things like, hey, get started, but we're not going to go into number crunching for you. This is just how you get going. And it's perfect because it was people's appetite to see like what then, you know, I go on in the forum and I go, hey, you know, if you want to see what these rewards are, that's what I've done. And then Tamriel Foundry has a, a nice one, too. Uh, that shows off all the rewards too. So go check theirs out um, as well. And I got some of the gold keys, like how to get them done, that sort of thing. So it's nice because the Dragon Star Arena, people don't know how to play it. They may be afraid to get in there. And, you know, you, you just got to get in there and be be okay with failing a couple times. It's okay. You're going to die, but, you know, just get in there and do it. This content's too good not to start doing it. Sure. Excellent. All right, that's going to end our game news. And before we move on, I want to make sure everyone knows that this show is sponsored by Amazon. So 
if you are like me and still haven't done any Christmas shopping, perhaps you should head over to Tales of Tamriel and click the little link and do your <laughs> Amazon shopping there. Because they still have a shipping option, which will get it here before Christmas. So I'm still safe for at least a few more days. Not much longer, but a few more days. So did so you buy did you buy the Kim Kardashian perfume for yourself or Thais? Well, no, I got it for you. Oh, God. <laughs> See, you ruined the surprise. See, now he's... I got it for Deltia. And oh. And now he knows. And now I'm going to have to send it back. Can I get, like, a giant butt mold or something? <laughs> so do we have to get presents for each other, like, in the game? In the game, like, like so, you get me a, a motive Santa. or something. Yeah, a secret. That'd be fun. A secret Santa. In game. In game. Nice. That'd be good. I. uh Thais is gonna get all the Nern root. Just yes. big bunches of Nern root. You know, if 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 Zaz is listening, what I would really like for Christmas Pig. is a race change. Oh. <laughs> she wants to be an Argonian. I want to be an Argonian so badly. <laughs> All I want for Christmas See, is and, a race change, please. <laughs> and Atropo says she was playing a Breton now, but now she wants to, after playing Ebonheart Pact, loves the Argonians and wants to go full Argonian. I do. Oh my God. So now she's got faction pride for the the sap lickers. I could not be filled with any more faction pride than I do right now, and that was mean. <laughs> Why would you say that about them? Because it's true. Look at their lore. Oh, God, I love them. And they're so cute, my big beefy buff Argonian. I found him, so by the way. Did. Yeah, he's yes. in Mournhold, in the one in you go where you have to try to pull that lady out to kill her. I know I, it's kind of crazy. I am so excited. I found him the other day on my alt. All right, moving on to the discussion, but it's not really a discussion this week because we have Atropos here, and we're going to do a little interview with him. So uh -oh. Atropos, since. Anyone who's playing ESO should know who you are, but for the people who don't know who you are, why don't you tell us a little about, about that and what your gaming background is? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am a longtime MMO gamer that has been you know, involved as a participant in MMO communities since uh, since EverQuest One, that's where I got my start. Uh, I was pretty pretty young at the time. I didn't, you know, I, I don't have a lot of uh, you know stripes and and, and plaudits to, to share from EQ One. But I guess what EQ One did for me was that it sort of opened uh, my eyes to the the world of of online RPGs, and you know, I I, I definitely blame it for for hooking me on the the genre and so i've been playing mmos ever since and i guess my sort of uh you know biggest sort of most memorable experience with with a game as you can probably guess from our conversation so far uh was dark age of camelot but i've i've played you know almost every um major mmo in between whether it's you know star wars galaxies to star wars the old republic to lineage to guild wars to you know anything that you can you can imagine i've probably played played a bit of it but you know f for all of those experiences I i've very much just been a, a player i've been a guild member um and i've benefited a lot during all of those games from from really great websites great guilds great community resources that i would rely on and, and get involved in uh to to make my um gameplay experience a lot more enjoyable and so you know as i was for the past you know three about three years ago i, I found myself in a bit of a lull where i was see, feeling like a little bit between games you know the the mmo genre was in my mind, going through a little bit of a sort of slightly barren spell, um, and I was really looking forward to Elder Scrolls Online as the you know the game that I thought would be one that I could really dedicate my time to and, and be really happy playing for for possibly years to come. And so um, I think what I, I really wanted to try to do with ESO was to to be one of the folks that was was driving the sorts of community sites the sorts of resources that i'd 
really been lucky to benefit from it during past games. So, you know, I, I wanted to try to give back a little bit. That sounds a little bit, you know, cheesy or whatever. But, but I also wanted to just see if I could do it because I'm not, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not a, a professional uh, web developer. I'm not, you know, I, I didn't have much background in, in creating sites or tools or content, but, um, you know, I really enjoy projects and, and hobbies and tinkering. Uh, and I, I wanted to try to, A, you know, see if I could make it work and uh, B, learn some cool things while, while doing it. And so, uh, you know, for those two reasons, uh, Tamriel Foundry was born, which uh, if, if you don't know it, it's just um, tamrielfoundry.com. And it's a, uh, it's a community site that features guides, it features discussion, uh, articles, um, and, and, a, and a really active uh, ESO player community that hopefully serves as, as a resource, a meeting place, and, and a, a sort of um, place to, to discuss the game and its underlying mechanics and, and, and a place where we can discuss uh, upcoming developments, builds, tactics, strategies, all of that good stuff that, that really more dedicated players uh, really love digging into um, and really wrapping their, their heads around. So um, it's been a really interesting journey, and I, I think maybe there's some folks uh, who will remember the, you know, the earliest incarnations of, of, of TF, and uh, I hope that you all agree that it's you know, come a long way since then, but um, it's been a really exciting journey for me, and, and, and I'm really thrilled to see where it's ended up. And uh, you know, a, as... To, to, to mirror what Deltia said earlier, you know, I think we're getting the opportunity to work with Zenimax and enjoy the support that they've provided uh, for the site has really been uh, a really rewarding experience as well. So um, hopefully that gives you a, a little bit of a summary of who I am and, and, and what I do. But uh, I guess I develop the site, I maintain it, I work uh, on, on continuing to create content for it. Uh, I also dabble in add-ons and uh, guild leadership in my limited spare time, but um, yeah, it's it's been a it's been a great way to uh, sort of center my ESO gameplay experience on something um, with a little bit of hopefully you know permanence, and, and it's been it's been a really fun journey. Excellent. Um, yeah, I've I've been following you guys forever, and I remember you were one of the first group of people i know tropos you were especially like with the guild summit uh not just the guild summit that's the one i thought of most recently because somebody had recorded it i don't know if they were supposed to but they did and it was funny because i could hear your voice in there asking questions every like three seconds it was great <laughs> um as well as you were one of the first people to release a little bit of news back early like early closed beta they gave kind of a first look at what the game was, where it was going. So, yeah, I've been I've been glued to your site for a very, very long time. Um, so, I mean, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, and you kind of covered a little bit. The Elder Scrolls Online, what, like, I know you talked about just a little bit, but what actually about Elder Scrolls Online actually drew you to it? Like, game mechanic-wise, was it developers? You know, what set this game apart? among the, as we know, after the Warcraft era, now there's just been 900 MMOs out there yeah. that kind of fall and disappear after a year or so. What made this one stand out to you? Uh, I think it's probably two main things. Uh, one was the tone of the game. You know, I, I've really enjoyed a lot of... Uh, different flavors of MMO, whether it's sort of the cartoonish fantasy, WoW-esque uh, aesthetic, whether it's the, you know, science fiction uh, side of things, like, uh, you know, I, I really loved uh, Star Wars Galaxies, um, you know, Star Wars The Old Republic, sort of, you know, the sci-fi uh, WoW style um, implementation. But, you know, for me, the... Um, I guess the sort of feel, the style, the aesthetic of game that I respond best to and what just really draws me in and makes me want to just be a part of this world is sort of the slightly or more realistic, gritty fantasy setting. And so, you know, when I learned that Elder Scrolls uh, 
was going to be brought into the MMO space, I just, you know, immediately was very excited about it because the test franchise is one that I've really loved for a while. I, um, I, I've been playing since Morrowind, um, and, you know, I've, I've loved all three of... I actually haven't really gone back to play much of Daggerfall or Arena. I think, I think I'm just too, too pressed for time or too snobbish when it comes to graphics to, to really... Uh, bring myself to do it but you know i've heard great things about those titles as well um but yeah i mean I, i've really really loved the the test franchise uh and it's definitely the type of sort of grittier darker fantasy that um i would i would like to spend a lot of time you know uh playing so that was one side of it the other side was the sort of developmental stuff there's a lot of ex-mythic employees at Zenimax. Um, and I think, you know, when I learned that, you know, all, not only were they doing, uh, Elder Scrolls in, in an MMO space, but, you know, they were doing it with a, a three faction system and, and a PVP implementation that was definitely done in, in the spirit of, of Dark Age of Camelot. I think those two things together just definitely sold me, sold me on the game. Absolutely. Uh, I, I'm with you on that 100%. I love the dark fantasy, and this is definitely one of those where it's got it's got that gritty, mature fantasy that I like, and that's what kind of drew me to the whole Elder Scrolls franchise in the beginning, was that super dark, like, oh my goodness, um, kind of feeling you get, such as even in Skyrim when you first run into the cold of Namira and they're like eating people. It's like other games don't show this. This is so cool. Um, it, it's that mentality when you go into it that I really loved about this game. And yeah, and, and the nostalgia feeling from Dark Age of Camelot is, is still there. So jumped on that. Now, with the creation of Tamro Foundry, I, I jumped on this because I was an ex-WoW player for a very long time, very much into the theory crafting, and when I saw your site and what you guys were doing, it's one of the reasons that I jumped on it. It reminded me of the old, um, oh crud, why can I not remember the name of it now? The Elitist Jerks forums, stuff like that, where people were talking about builds, they were talking about mechanics. And for anyone who doesn't know, they do talk about that a lot on Tamriel Foundry. You should definitely check it out, become a member, just do it. Just, it's awesome. Um, now, the other thing I know, we'll wrap up this interview here real quick with, uh, you, you're doing a new thing, uh, featured builds. And I believe the first build you featured is one you are currently running, am I right? Uh, yeah, when I when I can. Typically, I, um, typically I've, I've been tanking a lot lately for our group content. Um, I don't necessarily always get to run this build, but it is sort of like my preferred setup when I'm just playing my main character on its own. And it's one it's a build that I've been playing uh, sort of the spirit of the build since uh, since beta, which is a stamina based uh, high self health sustain sorcerer DPS build. Um, and so, you know, the builds evolved a bit since then but I think I posted up a first a first draft of a, a build guide for it. Um, you know, a month and a half before the game actually came out. And, um, you know, I've been maintaining that uh, since then. And I think the current patch cycle is one that's pretty fun for, for stamina-based sorts, just, just mostly because the the bow line is in a really, really great place right now. But, um, but yeah, you know, I, the, the featured builds, they've been... There's tons of builds that really great players and build authors... Uh, have been sharing on TF for a while. Um, and that's really been sort of concentrated on the forums. Um, but I've always sort of wanted to make strides towards taking some of those builds and uh, giving them more permanent housing on the site. And so really the motivation for starting that series was to sort of develop a template and a framework for doing that so that we can... Uh, put together a you know a listing of, of builds that have been sort of certified by competent end game players for each patch cycle, so that you know people who maybe don't have quite as much time on their own to do you know individual theory crafting or number crunching can easily you know have builds that they like to follow and, and easily keep up with you know how they might want to adapt their playstyle to be as effective as possible uh, you know for any given for any given patch. 
Excellent. Yeah, I'm using a... Uh, I wish I could remember the forum user's name. I feel so bad. I should have looked it up. But uh, there's a Crusader build on there. It seems very popular for Templars, two-handed Templars. I've been using that a lot, basing off his stuff for my build, mm -hmm. and I've been having a blast with it. I feel so bad. I don't remember the guy's name. I'll have to look it up. Um, but, yeah, definitely a lot of good stuff out there on that site. So if anyone's interested, definitely go check it out. All right. We're going to move on to our next section, which is the Tales of Tamar, where we get to talk about our week in game. And Atropos, since you're our guest, uh, did you get to play any ESO this week? Uh, yes, I certainly did. Um, this was a good week for me. I don't know the, the format of how you usually do this segment, but uh, um, I guess uh, this was a, a good week for me because we... Uh, I guess the two highlights would be that we put up our my, a new personal best veteran DSA time and uh, a new guild best uh, serpent time, guild serpent kill. So those were two real great highlights for, for Entropy Rising and, and for myself this week. Um, but yeah, other than that, I, I've just been sort of doing some, some questing, some dungeons, chipping away on my uh, pile of achievements that i'm still trying to get done all right yeah are you an achievement hunter do you like going through and and picking achievements just going for them yeah typically yes uh, i haven't been able to be quite as aggressive on the achievement front with the so as i have been in past mmos simply because i have a lot of competing <laughs> competing uses for my time with mm -hmm. the guild leadership with the website with working on the add-ons and so you know, I, I've had to to take it a, a little bit easy, but I'm 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 closing in slowly on the thirteen thousand mark, which is which is pretty pretty top end in the achievement hunter circles. So you know, I'm a little bit behind some of the top guys in our guild, but I think I've got um, twelve uh, twelve thousand seven hundred now. So very nice. I, I I've been going way slow. Uh, I think I'm only at like nine thousand or something like that. It's pretty low. So, yeah, no, it's I love achievement hunting. It's one of my favorite things to do, especially once you've leveled a character to max. And, you know, if you're in a raiding progression type guild, you pick days that you're going to be raiding. The days that you're not, you kind of fill in getting your consumables and things of that together. And, but once you have that, if you have free time, that's what I always do is achievement hunt. So I, I love the achievement system within this game. Um because of how it's formatted, how it's structured. It, it, it's just neat how they did it. I like it. Because some other games, their achievement systems aren't the best. Others are really good. Thais is sneezing up a storm over here, I think. <laughs> Choking on cat hair. Cat hair. <coughs> All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> See what happens when you have a Khajiit on your desk? Do you really have room to talk? Like, Pinello was all up in your grill. I know, but I'm used to it by ago. now. <laughs> I'm used to it. All right, uh, Deltia, what have you been doing this week? Well, uh, I was with the Tropos when we were doing that Serpent stuff, and that was really fun. That was my my first time ever completing that, so mm -hmm. it was a blast. And I uh, I was tanking below, if you guys know the fights at all, uh, why Tropos took the Manacora, and then I went DPS uh, all the way through until the end, and a, a buddy of mine, Brick, who has helped me a lot with Dragonstar Arena, and I took the Lamias, which is like a huge responsibility. It's really good for a DK to do it because you have to pull them and you have to stun them. And, and basically the mechanic is there's these things up in the background that will essentially screw up your team if you don't take care of them. And you have only, you know, 15, 20 seconds to deal with them. And you have all this pressure. They could, And if they die, they blow up. So if they go on your team and die and blow up, you've just, you know, spent two hours getting this one stage and screw it all up. So I, I like having all that pressure on me. It's just fun to see it when you execute it. And Brick, like his first time ever doing it, was just fantastic. So we did that, and I, I screwed up something. I forget what it was. And the boss was like at 1%, and bang, I died, of course. But we got through it with a few people up, and I was dead. And it was like, did we kill it or did everyone die? Oh, and then I saw the complete on there, and it, it was mm. awesome. So I got the, the achievement, and we got some epic loot. Wow, there are some cool sets from there. 
like some cool the medium set is amazing it is just like super epic so now correct me if i'm wrong Atrobus, but they did the same sort of thing where the traits are random on those drops right atropos oh i'm sorry mute mute, mute strikes mute strikes again jeez <laughs> Uh, yes, you are correct. The uh, the traits indeed are random on those drops, on the armors. So with that, it's it's good and bad, you know. I mean, I got a really cool has chest piece, uh, medium, but then again, the head's like reinforced. So it's going to take a lot of time doing Serpent to get, you know, exactly the gear you want. But it was a lot of fun. I really like that dungeon. You know, I'm kind of a Trials noob uh, since I've only been doing it since I joined, you know, Entropy Rising. And it's a lot more fun doing the Serpent uh, than just, basically 10 minute just no mechanics burn through AA type stuff I really like the trial and I like the big 12 people group but I've really been spending a lot of time in Dragon Star Arena just trying to get um, get more comfortable with a veteran you know my theory about making guys is to teach is to learn twice and every time I you know knowing the fights and teaching them are two different things because now I have to tell people how mm -hmm. they have to best do it and so it really steps my game up and going, well, now I just don't have to worry about this one mob. I have to worry about everyone's job. And so now I've been trying to play it as a healer, as a tank, as a DPS to really understand how to optimize everyone's job. So that's what I've been doing. I mean, I played Dragonstar. I'm doing it right now probably 30 times. I didn't get one master weapon this week. <laughs> <laughs> 30 times where are you Bo? and atropos beat my my time so i'm mad at him about that <laughs> but yeah it's all Get fun i, I know. know it's been a lot of fun being in the guild though entropy rising it's it's really coordinated well run and everyone takes you know responsibility for if you make a mistake it's not the end of the world but yet you know you got to be accountable about it so i really enjoyed that and um this is a lot of fun getting to see the content that I've I couldn't manage putting together on my own. You know, making the guides and making the guild. I just I kind of fail. I fail more times as a guild leader than I do succeed. And it's nice being in somewhere I, I can just be a player. You know, and I can just do my job. And someone else has to worry about getting people together, getting people to show up. You know, I can be that good follower where I show up and I just execute. So that's been a lot Sorry, of fun. Tropist. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't envy you. I, I hated being a guild leader of a raid environment before because it's like herding cats. They yeah, he gets a lot of good good players, so and good officers. You get some good people, but if you don't, then it's, it's herding cats. Any raid leader will know it's herding cats. That's what it is. Um, now, I, I random other question. It's not really random, but I think it's pretty good. I know you guys have been... Or uh, this is for Atropos, really. Entropy Rising has been kind of promoted since the start as a you know end game progression type guild with that mindset. Now, how do you feel that Serpent Trial stacks up to? I guess I shouldn't say stacks up because AA and Hellra are pretty much jokes. You think they're making a right direction with the type of difficulty within Serpent versus what they did with the pushover of AA and Hellra? Definitely, it's definitely it's moving in the right direction for sure. Absolutely, um, I think that Serpent is really miles miles better as a as an as a challenge as a trial than than AA and Hellra were. Um, there are good fights in those first two trials, but Serpent feels much more like a raid mm -hmm. that I you know would be comfortable and with and, and used to from experiences in, in prior games than uh than either of those first two trials do although i think it's going to be very interesting um to see how they rebalance those trials for the champion system because mm -hmm. with the champion system all the abilities are changing all the stats are being rescaled the game is going to be collapsed down to level 50 and this gives them almost a second chance with um Hellra and aa a second chance to tune those trials in a way that's going to be more challenging. So, I mean, it's not going to be new bosses. They might be able to change a few things, but they will be able to rescale the health values, rescale damage values to make, you know, to possibly make those first trials a little bit more challenging. I mean, I think you, you look at some of the bosses in, in AA and you're talking like, you know, 15 to 20 second kill times mm -hmm. on a, a raid boss. 
and you look at Serpent and you're talking, you know, anywhere between like seven and, and 12 minute kill times for, for Manticora and uh, Serpent. And, and I think just like, it just feels so much more epic when you're really having to play the fight, play the mechanics and, and really struggle with it for a while before you, you get the satisfaction of, of beating <laughs> the fight. So yeah. even even just rescaling the fights as, as part of the champion system updates will improve the first tier of, of trials. I mean, I, I still think that mechanically Serpent, though, it, it is way better. It's definitely a step in the right direction. Excellent. Yes, yeah, uh, raving is where my heart lies. It, it is what I like to do in, in games. Um, another question, which doesn't really go towards this, but I, I want to get your opinion since we have you on the show. How do you feel as the trial format, really? I mean, with it being no raid lockouts, technically Serpent is two bosses, two mini bosses kind of thing. How do you feel the smaller layout of trials fits into the epic raid encounter versus the longer raids from past games, either with lockouts or like DOAC's master level stuff without lockouts, where there was fairly long progression to down everything? Yeah, it's a it's a tough question. I mean, I I am someone who is a fan of conventional rating, so um, I didn't really feel the need to to completely rewrite that formula. Um, but I think that the trials offer some nice things. I I'm not a big fan personally of the time comp competing in the time mm -hmm. dimension. I'm more of a fan of uh, completing to actually be, you know, the the first or among the first to to complete a cha a new challenge. Um, so completion to me is a, a much bigger reward than than doing something just but doing it faster. Yeah. Um, and you know, ESO is really built around the the idea of of the time trial as as what's really driving people to compete and. Um, no, I think that's okay. It's not my favorite raid setup, but it's it's one that I like enough that I'm happy for us to continue, um, you know, trying to excel in that regard as a guild. Okay. And I see Kipster in chat. Kipster, you were great for interview with a raider, good sir. I just had to ask his opinion on these things as well. <laughs> um, I had an interview with a raider interview earlier with Kipster, a great friend in the guild who was part of Defunct. Um, talking about raids and stuff of that nature within the game because as you say i'm a conventional raider myself and when eso announced they weren't going to have raids that you know you you know that uh i guess news faux pas where we're not going to have raids and then they came back and we're like we just didn't want to have raids like other games have raids that that whole marketing faux pas mm -hmm. um I, I about gave up on the game at that point because i'm not a pvp'er I'm a PvE endgame player. I'm like, well, if I'm not going to have it, I may play and play through the story and then just be done with it. But when they announce Trials, I'm like, finally, they're listening to the the Raider in me and we're going to we're gonna go. I was excited when AA and Hellrock came out. And then I was very devastated. Like when they were talking about the news, they were saying, oh, it'll take a, a skilled party an hour to an hour and a half to, to finish it. First day, mm -hmm. drop nine minute clear. I was devastated. I was like, "This is crap." You know what I mean? Just because the way they taunted it up that it was going to be difficult. Yeah, it was only going to be a couple bosses, but it's supposed to be super difficult. Even a top, you know, top team is still going to take an hour to finish it, and people were getting nine minute clears day one. I was like, "Wow." When when well, veteran dungeons think, take longer. I don't think anyone put up that fast a time on day one, but it, I, I agree with the spirit of what you're saying. It was closer to nine minutes than it was closer to an hour and a half. <laughs> mm, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that, it was a little exaggeration, but it still was a heck of a lot closer to you know, the low end than what they were. They were pretty much making it that the, you know, entropy risings and paragons and paradigm shifts of the world those elite raiding guilds would still take an hour and a half to beat it and it was what it what it was so i was very devastated when it came out that it was so slow and then i was very happy when serpent came out and 
how long did it take for the first clear? Like three weeks or something like that? It yeah, a, it was it was much delayed. Yeah. It was a very long time and that, that excited me. So um definitely was I think they're stepping in the right direction. I'm still a fan of conventional rating. I kinda hope they introduce I know people aren't fan of lockouts, but I don't see how they would be able to introduce a raid with more than a handful of bosses without lockouts being able to save progress. I don't see how it's possible. But Yeah. Anyway, yeah, hopefully good, good I trust thing. developers. Hopefully they'll come up with something. If they stick with the trials, I'm okay with it. I think it would be neater if they did trials, as in they released a couple of them at a time, kind of like AA and Hellra. That way people had a little bit more progression as a whole. But Anyway off topic of there anything else you guys want to talk about for your weekend game before Thais and i talk nope no? it's just been i i mean i really like the serpent clear was pretty epic the battles are fun i mean the first battle is a blast like manacora is one of the it's just like if he goes down the hole i have to pick it up and it has to be mm-hmm. like a split second thing or everyone dies like if you lose taunt someone die i mean it's just you're on pens and needles for like 10 minutes of the fight a good raid is all about its mechanics, and if there's good mechanics that make the fight fun, and it's not a tank and spank, it, it, that's awesome. I, I remember you telling me about it, I remember Kipster telling me about the mana core, and I'm just sitting there like like a kid at Christmas with his uh, you know elbows on his knees, wide-eyed, going, tell me more. That sounds awesome. I'm st- I'm still Dragon Star Arena. It's by far my favorite, though. It's still just, I love the gameplay. It's chaotic. I mean, some of the stuff you can memorize, but overall, it's my definite... Because it's easy to pick up four people and go. And so I can do that week during the week, you know, not just our rating time. So I like that better, but yeah. All right. Uh, well, Thais was away on Dark Brotherhood assignments, so the only gameplay we have is mine, right? Yeah. Well, unless I can mention that while I was away, I only had my laptop and my iPad, so I played a lot of um, Farmville 2. Oh, uh, the elites are not <laughs> hardcore enough for that, guys. Atropos, you ever thought about, you know, opening up a Farmville 2 wing of Entropy <laughs> Rising for those hardcore <laughs> farmers? Well, you know, uh, Farmville Foundry is actually already in development. So. <laughs> Farmville oh Foundry. Gosh, can I be like, oh gosh, a moderator? <laughs> I play Farmville 2 way too much. <laughs> nice. You heard it here first, guys. Farmville, Farmville Foundry, Foundry coming I'm soon. So excited! <sighs> All right, well, good for you. <laughs> um, I've been leveling up my Khajiit Dragon Knight. Um, she's been a lot of fun. I've been I've, I've been liking her. She's actually done with Deshaun and into. Um, where's your swampy land that you like? Shadowfen. I just realized something. What? The other character that you play more than like more than your other alts mm-hmm. is actually the character you named after your horrible nasty cat. Yes. What what class is it? It's a dragon knight. Oh, so the best that's uh, Tropos's favorite class. <laughs> he's he's hoping they get a buff with like magma armor cuz hey, it's not I, you enough. You heard me earlier and if you listen to me on uh, Elder Scrolls off the record, I pretty much got booed off the thing where saying dragon knights are so OP they need to be nerfed bad. Like, even at my, in my 25 to 30 range that I'm at, things aren't killing me. I'm like, it's almost so OP, it's not even fun. <laughs> That's how I feel about them, but I could be wrong. I'm not, but I, that's how I feel. Um, but I've been playing with her, doing Deltia Shooting Star, albeit, as, as he said in his one video, running the rest of staff to stay alive, because, um... I don't know. I've been soloing dolmens and like roll bosses by just kiting in a circle and just keeping green dragon blood up like every three seconds. Like, boom, no, nope, boom, no. Nope. And it, things just don't kill me. It's it's kind of crazy. <laughs> it's nice, ain't it? Having a self heal. Just walking around backwards, heavy attacking with the Destro staff. Every time I get one of them up, I'm able to do green dragon. Just boom. All right. Full health again. Heavy attack, walking backwards, green dragon blood. That's all I do, and that's just a big circle. That's how I do all the... But it's nice to be able to complete dolmens by myself and world bosses. Don't need to call out for anyone. Just walk in a circle, heavy attack with the Destro, keep green dragon blood up. I just don't die. Nothing else. I don't do... I don't, no other abilities needed. That's it. Um, so I've been doing that, and then I 
stopped on her because I decided what I was going to do was I was trying to get my last quote unquote banking alt up um, because I try to get the hirelings on all my characters. That way I can just hop down the list and grab hirelings for everyone. Well, I filled up my last spot with uh, an Imperial Templar and the goal wasn't really to play it. It was just to do a few quests to get a couple skill points and try to get some hirelings. Well, she's like level 12 now and I've been playing her through Shadow or Stonefalls. So she's almost through Stonefalls at the moment. Um, doing something different with her as a Templar. I've been doing the sword and board and she's been a lot of fun to play. So, But yeah, in reality, I didn't intend her. All my banking alts... I call them banking alts, but I essentially I play them up to a certain level to get enough skill points to actually be able to get hirelings and things of those nature, earn a little bit of money, because then I buy the one gold Imperial horse, and then I max out the bag space on them, that kind of stuff, because they're hoarders. And, uh, yeah, but I've been playing her. So I kind of parked my Khajiit Dragon Knight in Shadow, or, yeah, Shadowfen, and I've been playing through on my Imperial paladin or not paladin templar i only say paladin because i'm building it off of uh Esteldin's build on the tot site that he made the full tank build and i've been having fun with that so that's where i did what i did this weekend and of course doing a bunch of guild stuff uh trying to get that trader going and things of that nature so that's what i did so that's the end of our tail section we're going to move on to our dramatic reading because we didn't have one last week and we're continuing again with the third book in the series simply called literature this should be a fun one because it's myths of sheogorath who doesn't love sheogorath volume one so thais go for it you must say his author name good luck it's easy mimophonus all right good luck with that. it's mim o bonus all right, fine. Okay, all right, we good? Yeah, okay. we're good. <laughs> I love you. King Lyandir was known to be an exceedingly rational man. He lived in a palace that was a small, simple structure, unadorned with art and ugly to look upon. I do not need more than this, he would say. Why spend my gold on such luxuries when I can spend it on my armies or on great public works? His kingdom prospered under his sensible rule. However, the people did not always share the king's sense of practicality. They would build houses that were beautiful to look upon, although not necessarily very practical. They devoted time and energy to works of art. They would celebrate events with lavish festivals. In general, they were quite happy. King Lyandir was, was disappointed that more of them did not follow his example and lead frugal, sensible lives. He brooded on, the, on this for many years. Finally, he decided that his subjects simply didn't understand how much more they could accomplish if they didn't waste time on those frivolous activities. Perhaps, he reasoned, they just needed more examples. The king decreed that all new buildings must be simple, unadorned, and no larger than was necessary for their function. The people were not happy about this, but they liked their king and respected the new law. In a few short years, there were more plain buildings than ornate ones. The citizens used the money saved to make and buy even more lavish art and hold more excessive celebrations. Once again, King Lyandir decided to provide them a strict example of how beneficial it would be to use their time and resources for more practical purposes. He banned all works of art in the city. The people were quite put out by this but they knew that their king was doing what he thought was best for them. However, human nature is not so easily denied. In a few more years, the city was filled with plain, simple buildings and devoid of any sort of art. However, the people now had even more money and time to devote to their parties and festivals. With a heavy heart, King Lyandir decided that his people were to be treated like children. And like children, they needed rules and discipline laid down by great figures of authority to make them understand what was truly important in life. He decreed that there should be no revelry in the city. Singing, dancing, and music were all banned. Even food and drink were limited to water and simple foodstuffs. 
the people had had enough. Revolt was out of the question, since King Lyandir had a very well-trained and equipped army. They visited the shrines and temples in droves, praying to all the gods, and even to some of the Dajic princes, that King Lyandir would revoke these new oppressive laws. Shiagorath heard their pleas and decided to visit King Lyandir. He appeared to the king in his dreams as a field of flowers, each with arms instead of petals, and the face of the mad god in the center. I am the lord of the creative and lord of the deranged. Since you have no use for my gifts of creativity, I have decided to bless you with an abundance of my other gift. From that day forward, every child born in the city was born into madness. Since infants do not reveal illnesses of the mind, it was several years before this was realized. The king's own son was among the victims, suffering from seizures and delusions. Yet King Lyandir refused to change his ways. When his son, Glint, was twelve years old, he stabbed his father while Lyandir was sleeping. With his dying breath, King Lyandir asked why. His son replied, it is the most practical thing I could do. The new young king ordered all the palace servants slaughtered. He ordered a grand festival to celebrate his new reign and repeal and the repeal of Lyandir's laws. He served the crowds a stew made from the carcasses of the palace servants. He ordered the east facing walls of every building painted red and the west facing walls painted in stripes. He decreed that all citizens wear ornate masks on the backs of their heads. He then burned down the palace and began construction of a new one. In the new palace, the young king ordered his personal chambers to not have any doors, for fear that small woodland creatures would attack him. He ordered that it, it have no windows, for fear that the sun and moon were jealous of him in plotting his death. And thus ended the line of King Leandir. The people of the city returned to their grand works of art and raucous celebrations. They talked and acted as if they still had a living king, and even kept up the palace, using it to house and care for their mad children. Shiagorath was mightily pleased with this outcome. From that day forward, the city was blessed with more than the normal number of gifted artists and deranged citizens. I love Shiagorath. So do I. <laughs> That's great. I <laughs> the king's name was really hard to pronounce. Was that correct? Mm -hmm, I okay. think so. Uh, yeah, it looks right. Okay. Uh, it's great. Small woodland creatures. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually think I would want the door to keep them out. Keep them out? Yeah. yeah. Every time I run across any of his quests in any game, uh, you know, either it be the Shivering Isles expansion in Oblivion, um, you know, the the Blue Palace and Skyrim. I love anywhere during the Mages Guild in ESO. He is by far my favorite Daedric Prince. He's just hilarious. I love talking to him. So he's he's just great. All right. We're going to move on to our next section, which is an add-on spotlight. Ironically, I already had FTC as the add-on spotlight. And You're just saying that. No, I actually did. You can ask... <laughs> on the notes for a while now so we even have a question yes for atropos since it was you know it fit into this this, this section here mm -hmm. arcanir asks to atropos have you been into mod development before eso uh no much like the much like the website uh itself this was all sort of new to me. I just like dabbling. I'm a tinkerer. I like the hobby aspect of it. And I think that um, when during beta, when the API notes first started coming out for ESO, I was looking them over just mostly out of curiosity rather than real intent. But, you know, out of curiosity, really, I was sort of looking them over and reading through the different events and functions that were available to the API and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, hey, you know, I, I could do something with this. I could take, you know, this function and this event and, you know, listen for when uh, the player gets a, a new buff on himself so that I could put a little timer that would let us know how long that buff's going to last so Thank that you. I would know better when, when I needed to, you know, refresh my, my critical surge. And, you know, life was wonderful and brilliant and then 
uh, the dark days came and Zoss took all that away. But, um, you know, but uh, I, I'm, I'm speaking partially in jest. But, uh, no, the, the add-on stuff was new to me, just like the website was. I, it was something that I hadn't really planned to do, but the opportunity came around, and I thought it'd be another cool hobby and little project to, to tackle uh, that would make my game experience uh, more enjoyable. And so here we are. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, it has to be on my, in my game to use it. Even, um, I know I sent you a message on the Tamro Foundry forums about the frames. Like, can I hide them outside? Cause I still like to be immersed in the game, but in combat, I like the, the group frames, but the buff timers are so useful. Even if it's just personal buff timers are incredibly useful. Like you said, the crit chart or crit surge, um, when they change the two-handed weapon for rally, having that buff up all the time is helpful. Um, so yeah, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your add-on, what it can do, and that kind of stuff. Then we have a few other questions for you as well. Uh, sure. Yeah. So I mean, basically, the designers at Zenimax, their stated mission objective with the SO is to, um, you know, have a very very minimal interface with uh, a notable uh, scarcity of sort of on-screen interface based cues and rather they wanted to put all the information that the player needs in order to uh, in, in order to play their character they wanted to put that information into the game world itself so the idea is that if you have a buff and that buff lasts 20 seconds you're gonna have like a glow a visible glow on your hands that will help you to know that you have this buff and when your hands stop glowing it means that you no longer have the buff and you know i think from a pure immersion perspective uh the the objective of making this like very immersive very uh world that's easy to sink into this was a, a good call uh you know it's it's nice for people to be able to really put aside the interface elements and focus on what's happening in the game world so I understand, you know, from a design decision why those decisions were, were made by, by their um, developers. But uh, as a player, I am very much more in the vein of the, you know, Dungeons & Dragons character sheet designer. You know, like, I want to know how many skill points I have in, in X, Y, and Z, and I want to know what my attribute modifiers are, and I want to know you know, exactly what every single statistic about my character means and how it works and how my, how, you know, when I hit something for a certain amount of damage, I want to know, you know, where that number is coming from. Um, and, you know, that extends into combat as well. You know, I wanted to know how hard am I hitting? How long are my buffs lasting? Uh, exactly what percentage of my health and my target's health is remaining? Uh, you know, how, how close is my ultimate to being full uh i want to know you know over the course of a fight how much damage did i do during using a certain skill so that if i try to change my build to make it better i can actually tell if it you know if it actually worked or not um so all of these things just foundry tactical combat came to be as sort of a all-inclusive package of tools that's designed to give players the sorts of information they need to make those decisions. And it doesn't do a perfect job of that. I think there's lots of really great combat add-ons out there, some of which uh, I'm not ashamed to admit I think do a, a better job of certain things than, than mine does. But FTC is supposed to be, you know, for people who don't want to spend a ton of time configuring, you know, 50 different add-ons, it's supposed to be sort of a one-stop solution for getting that information into the player's hands in a, in a framework that, you know, is visually consistent and maintained and, and isn't too hard to set up and use. So uh, it has some of the, the main features of it include uh, frames, so player and target frames, uh, buff timers, combat text, uh, combat uh, damage tracking, and some other sort of interface-based cues and alerts to help you to, uh, to respond uh, more appropriately to, to, to evolving combat situations. Excellent, excellent. Um, we had one other question for you. Um, do you have any plans 
on doing anything with group frames? Or is that even in the API? It, it is in the API, yeah. Uh, I think that's something I'd like to do in sort of the uh, FTC mold. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, much as the FTC has player frames, uh, I, I'd love eventually to have group frames that have um, a high level of functionality and, and aesthetically they match the player frame and uh, they're customizable. You know, I, I think this is definitely one of the things on my wish list for FTC, but there's also a number, you know, a lot of other things on that list and, and we'll see, you know, in what order I'm able to get to things. Uh, the, the Tamriel Foundry website sort of fairly recently had a big update that I'd been mm -hmm. working on for several months. And now that that has finally come to fruition, I think I'm going to have more time to get back to act actively developing FTC, whereas for the past uh, couple months, it's been more of a sort of maintain, just keep it up to date uh, with the, you know, the game version. But uh, I, I'm really excited to get back to developing FTC, and I think that adding new features like that is something that I would definitely consider doing uh, if if I, you know, start exploring it and it, it seems promising. Okay. Um, yeah, definitely appreciate you updating it because so many add-on developers in this game, it feels like, have stopped updating their add-ons because, I don't know, maybe the game wasn't for them when they jumped into it. I mean, other than you and uh, Wicked, you, like, you're the only two add-on developers and I don't know of any others i'm sure there's others who do update and there are a lot of add-on developers in the community i'm thankful for a bunch of them who've actually went on like a resurrection project going through and taking the code from the previous yeah. ones yeah. and trying to revive old add-ons when they stop being updated but it's definitely good to see that you've been updating it and it's definitely helpful yours is the one of the few add-ons other than like wicked stuff that i can rely on when a new patch comes out that the, it'll be updated Others, I'm kind of crossing my fingers and kind of hoping, like, please update this kind of thing. Well, um, I think it makes I think it makes a big difference when the add-on author is also like an, an enthusiast player of the game. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of add-on authors, maybe you know, th there's financial incentives for for maintaining certain add-ons, and you know, it, it it's tough. But I think some of the the add-on authors who had originally started creating a lot of content for ESO, you know, wanting to use it themselves in ESO as their primary game, you know, if, if that sort of person decides that ESO as a game isn't exactly what they're looking for, it's, it's really tough to, you know, to expect them to continue updating their ESO add-ons. Sure. But I also, I, I don't know, this, this is, I'm not, re I don't really, I'm not really sure whether this is correct or not, but in past games, I, I've used add-ons, and I, I felt like, as an outsider in past games, add-on authors were typically um, very respected within the community, like uh, both by um, players and by the developers who sort of recognized their contribution as being something that, you know, someone's put a, a tremendous number of hours in in order to make the game better at, you know, at, at no cost to the developer. Um, I feel like the, the add-on community in ESO, for whatever reasons, has been a little bit toxic uh, since launch, and I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly the reasons for that. I'm, I'm actually one of the least actively involved add-on authors in, you know, on like the discussion forums on ESO UI or, or, or what have you, because I've got all these other projects that, that are, you know, taking up my time. But I, I think it's been a little bit sad that uh, some of the some of the add-ons and add-on authors have come under such like really cutting uh, criticism and and it, it's been difficult both from you know player the perspective of players and uh, Zoss themselves who have taken a very very defensive stance towards add-ons. I mean I think like some of the things for example whenever there's a a customer support ticket. Like the the top of their hit list in terms of things that they tell people to do is well you know you're using add-ons and add-ons are typically what cause problems with the game or uh, you know making everyone sign a, a disclaimer uh, agreement in order to to enable add-on functionality that like you know we are absolutely not responsible for anything add-ons do and of course that's all reasonable but it just sort of 
there's been a little bit of a hostile atmosphere, a hostile interaction between add-on authors and, and Zenimax and and the community. It, it's it's been it's been a difficult it's been a difficult situation. I think a lot of add-on authors just have found that a little unpalatable compared to uh, other games that they can develop for. Sure. I know specifically, I think all the way back in episode seven, I think I named it the Great Add-on War, which is a little play on, you know, lore and Elder Scrolls, um, was specifically about FTC and some of the, I know you came under some controversy, not just you, but the add-on itself, people saying people could use your add-on to bot because that was before they, you know, the dark times where they removed a lot of the API function where you could see buffs and stuff on targets, you could see cast bars. Yeah. Uh, I know your add-on in particular came under a lot of heat for that. Like on Reddit, it was the yeah. the page for that was extensive. It was it was scapegoated, I think, as something that would be single-handedly responsible for for botting an ESO. And then right. and then Zoss went and and disabled all of the things that people were asking them to disable. And you know, as we know, there were no bots in ESO at launch, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right? yeah. Those right? add-ons, man. All those um, Templars spamming biting jabs were real players. <laughs> Every yeah. one of them. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I I think um, it's been it, it's been a little bit unfortunate, and I, I think maybe with other games, the the difference between the add-on enabled version of the UI and the add-on disabled version of the UI is small enough that. Um, you know, everyone can pretty much get behind add-ons, and but with ESO, it's a little bit more contentious because the players that want an add-on-less UI, they feel really strongly about that, and the players that want, you know, an add-on enabled UI feel really strongly about that, and so I guess there's a bigger gap. Um, it, it, it's I think it's a lot of it's coming from the differences because this type of game is was originally a single-player game, which we'll say it's moddable, but ninety percent of the people who played Elder Scrolls games Oblivion and, and, and Skyrim were actually console players who couldn't mod anyway. Um, I feel like you're coming from a single player and an MMO. The two sides, MMOs are all about add-ons because let's face it, World of Warcraft, people will yell at you for not having add-ons. Like, you no, you will not bring people into a raid if they don't have deadly boss mods. It's just how it works. Other games, I'm sure, were similar. I don't know how Swotor was, or but Rift was that way. Like you had to have certain add-ons before you were even considered, you know, able to go. Several of the raid guilds I was in was saying, "You don't have deadly boss mods, you're not coming, and we will make you like do a you know the macro to make sure it works kind of thing." Mm -hmm. um, whereas this game with the Elder Scrolls Pierce, like we don't want no add-ons, we don't. I think that comes from a little bit of a misunderstanding about what they are. I feel it's unfair. People can have add-ons to see my stuff, so they shouldn't be allowed to have it either because I don't want to use it. You have two groups of people who both feel very strongly for what they want. So I feel bad for the add-on creators in this community because of the two varying you know, groups of people coming into this game. It's a little different. Um, wow. That was probably one of our best add-on spotlights ever because we had a little bit of a discussion with that. Oh, yeah. Sorry for getting up on my miniature soapbox about hey, it. Hey, I'm, I'm with you on that. I did a whole episode on add-ons and how great they were. And I think I actually got I got a lot of flack for that episode from purists going, no, no, these add-ons shouldn't be allowed to do it. I'm like, then don't use them. <laughs> I took a lot of flack for standing up for add-ons during that episode. That was still early in this uh, podcast life. Um, so yeah. All right. We'll go ahead and move on to our next section, which is our guild corner where we get to talk a little bit about the Tales of Tamriel guild. Now, Delty, are you at a point where we could possibly do this or do we not want to, uh, no show it on the screen? Uh, one second. Okay. Just start talking, start rattling off stuff. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Um, Wait, you want, you want to, are you sure you want to show people's like, they're okay with you showing them the rat name in game? Oh no no um I, I don't think it would matter. Oh, it matters. Uh, not too much. I mean if if you want to we don't have to that's fine I'll do yeah, it. Yeah I would say probably not just people some people don't want to get yeah let's, let's yeah, just ask right. them we'll next time. Wait this time we'll do it we'll do it this way and if people say something later we'll we'll worry about it. 
All right. Um, well, for those who don't know, Tales of Tamriel, we have our own little guild, which we're moving into a trading guild. And one of the things we're doing is we're doing guild raffles every week to try to earn a little money in the guild bank so we can do those guild traders because they are expensive. And we will pick one winner every week, and that winner will receive 30% of the profits earned. Now, this week was for our very first week was actually fairly good. Uh, the total pot is 57k, not bad for a very first pot. So, um, what I will do is pop in the numbers here on random.org. So that's two through do, 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 58. All right, let me put that in here real quick. And Thais is here. She can tell me this. So the number that generates is 12. So our little handy-dandy spreadsheet. For those of you who don't know, you can check it out on uh, Tales of Tamriel slash Guild. You can see the spreadsheet. I keep it there. So 12 is the winner. And the 12 is Ridge. Ridge. Congratulations, Ridge. You win the pot, which is currently 8,550 gold. I will send that to you in-game. Congratulations, good sir. And next week, we... We'll start another raffle after this and listen in for the winner. So, congrats, nice. Rich. Way to go. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, as for those who don't know, they get the third percent of the profits earned. The rest goes into the guild bank so we can buy guild traders. So, yay. Congrats. First winner, Ridge. Ridge, he's a great guy in the guild. Love him. Um, he was the one who helped us get a lot of our Dwemer stuff, doing a lot of the trading of motifs. If I had a bunch of them, I'm like, I'm still looking for one for Thais. He's like, what do you need? I'm like, well, I need this. And he's sending me all these. He's a great guy. So, emails time. We got two emails this week, Thais. Okay. Double click. That's his name, Double okay, Click. from Double Click. Season greetings. I was trying to get into the live stream Sunday, but I was out in the woods and my connection on my phone was really poor. While the video was in constant load, I managed to hear a small portion of audio that just so happened to be the part, to be part of the question I asked, which I thought was kind of cool. Anyway, I don't have any exact numbers, but we were running Spindle Clutch on vet mode, and the part where like 20 small spiders spawn, I was dying almost instantly. That's the part where you always stop looking. Oh, okay, and everyone <laughs> dies? Okay, yeah. all right, cool. Yeah. This happened three or four times. I told my group I don't know what is happening. This didn't happen last time. Maybe it was the glitch where my block wasn't activating or something. I assume maybe it was a change to werewolf. I poured it out and cured my lycanthropy. The first attempt back in felt like a uber tank when they spawned and had no issues. That was what I was basing my guess on. Looks like I will be picking it up again or maybe trying out vamp first. Thanks for testing it and glad I'm wrong. All right. So, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Double, for telling us where this, what was uh, the issue. Because last week, if you were listening, he asked a question about werewolf in human form, how he thought poison damage was you know, having this negative effect when in human form where it hadn't been up until the recent 1.5.6 patch, I guess. Um, I think that's what we were up to at the time. And we did some testing. I went on the PTS. Delty was playing with it. We didn't see any changes. So we were kind of curious where he was on that. And that, that fight sucks. Well, there's a, there's a lot of factors to that. I mean, yeah, it's a lot of subjectivity where you, you think that, you're getting nuked because of something, and it might just be 20 spiders hit you at the beginning, and you just can't do anything. And then you the, got ne the next, with a crit too. Well, you didn't have uh, diamond M on NPCs. I don't think crit, but you go. What? Yes, they do. No, impenetrable is worthless in PV. Astropos. Everything has yeah. crit. Yeah, Delta is correct. Oh. NPC, NPC enemies don't don't crit. It's actually, I wish they did. I mean, I think that would be cool. A lot more yeah. interesting. Although you'd have to be very careful about that with with bosses because, but in a raid environment, boss crits, there's there's a lot of hazards there in terms of your encounter design, mm -hmm. uh, because you have to make it to where players can, like you don't want RNG to be a source of player death, so if you're gonna have bosses crit, you need players to be able to have the tools to survive boss crits, and if you give players the tools to survive boss crits, then the non-crits are gonna. I mean, it, it's kind of a. I don't know. I hate the. I hate the term slippery slope, but that's sort of what you get. Yeah, I know other games bosses did have a base six percent crit, and 
at least this is coming from Warcraft. I know Rift had something similar where tanks had to have tools and there were spe specific tank stats that helped mitigate that crit chance. And if you didn't yes. have that, you yeah, certainly. Could, could risk that. So, okay. Anyway, yeah, that still is. That, that yeah, there's a lot that goes in that. I know we were doing that for a while um, when we were streaming the one day and we were dying constantly. And then that one tr attempt, everything just kind of went perfect. And everything went right. I don't know. It's because I looked. You looked? Yep. You were paying attention that uh -huh. time? Nice. All right. And last email from DoubleClick. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> hey, fellow ESOers. Something has been bothering me. Deltia. Oh, great. Deltia bothers me, too. <laughs> <laughs> that, that just, something bothers me. Deltia. Deltia. <laughs> End of email. <laughs> it does not take that long to find action in Cyrodiil. You do not need to ride across Cyrodiil in order to find it. You can easily port to your furthest outpost or keep and find the action in between or at the next castle. I love no camps. PvP requires skill and tactics now. No more endless Zerg wave. A camp is not a teleportation shrine. If they... If they bring them back, I hope they fix these issues. I hope you get your arena-style 1v1, 4v4, 8v8 PvP, but there will still be wait times on those as well. It's important to have patience. Cannot wait for the next episode. Thank you, DoubleClick. Uh, thank you so much for sending us emails, man, too. like this, He's great. He's been sending us emails, I think, the past two or three weeks now. It's great. So, Deltia, you got called out again, good sir. <laughs> That's fine. Um, regarding forward camps and PvP, I honestly, I had a pretty, I don't know, feedback intensive back and forth on comments on YouTube mm -hmm. where a guy said basically, from the way you were talking, you don't PvP very much. And it was actually true. I don't PvP a lot. And I don't PvP because I really don't like it. It's just a different style that I'm not used to. I mean, I did it in Warhammer, but it just felt, I don't know faster so i'm just gonna stop bashing on it because i probably don't have enough insight to really give a rational opinion it's just not fun for me and how i can find the fights and get in there and, and it's just it's not what i want it to be but that's okay because you know other people like it it's mm -hmm. just i haven't figured out how to get in the fights and if i do it's just it's just not fun it's not my play style i do not like it so if you like it that's fine but I'm going to be done ranting about it. I've given my two cents about it. It's just not for me. I want arenas. I want 4v4, 8v8, objective-based stuff. And if, until that happens, I mean, I might go in there for an hour or two and dink around. But it's just not my favorite thing. It's just not soloable. I don't like going on my own. I don't like sneaking. I've never liked that. It's just not my thing. Um, you're being called out that you played a bright wizard in Warhammer. I may have. <laughs> no, I I played a chosen. Oh dear. Uh, oh no. But yeah, I mean, I liked Warhammer. It's just I don't know. I, I find the people apparently. Yeah, well, I like the click. You know, click in a queue. You get in a group, and you can do it solo. The whole group aspect with having a lot of people in team speak. I mean, I'm honestly not a social butterfly. If you haven't got that already, I'm not. I I don't. Some days, you know, when it's raining time, I'll get in team speak. Other days, if I'm in a bad mood, I just want to play by myself and don't want to talk to anyone. And PvP was that outlet for me where I could just queue up solo, go in the Zerg, and mindlessly have fun for an hour. It's not that for me anymore. And I'd rather just pick flowers and do crafting writs like I'm doing right now. Because um, it's just it's just calm and fun. It was really exciting to me and fun. But to the guy's point on YouTube... And he did it tastefully. It was, it was, he just, you know, he said his opinion. That's fine. I honestly don't PvP enough to really give a huge meta opinion on it. I don't. And it's just not my thing. Okay. Hey, it's, I think if, if you go listen to uh, Delty's channel for, you know, our little collaborative issue, because we did talk about it and what we thought about PvP. And I, I don't believe the uh, Cyrodiil PvP is the mecca for competitive pvpers it's it doesn't have that so but uh, don't yeah. listen to it there don't listen to it here oh speaking right. of which uh speaking of which real quick mm -hmm. we're gonna be doing that kind of stuff throughout um 
we're going to be doing that kind of stuff throughout the week as things come up that might be kind of a little off topic, kind of, you know, before the show, probably once a week as we hear things, whether it's in the forums, on Tam- Tamriel Foundry, or just anything. It could be PvP, mid-maxing, whatever. Um, so if you want to come check the YouTube on my Delta is gaming on YouTube. That's what we'll be doing. We don't have a name for it yet. So if you have like a funny little name for it uh, and you want to let us know, please do. Cause I'm waiting to name it, but it's been a lot of fun, a lot of good discussion. And it's just a little 10 minute little thing. You can maybe watch, you know, on your lunch break or something. And, and it's a good discussion. gets you thinking on the game's direction. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. Great show. Final thoughts time. First off, I do want to say thank you, Atropos, for coming on, man. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's been a blast. I'm I'm really happy to be able to stop by. I've been looking forward to this. So uh, it's been been really nice chatting with y'all. Great. Um, do you have anything you'd like to say and maybe uh, plug anything like your site, where people can find you, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, sure. So the site is tamrielfoundry.com. Uh, the guild of which uh, Deltian is, is a member is is Entropy Rising. We're a sort of higher end Aldmeri Dominion PVE progression guild, uh, and you can find that through Tamriel Foundry as well. Uh, and I am at Atropos in game if you want to shout at me. Excellent. All right, Thais. You know, you had to do that, didn't you? What? Because I always usually go first. I uh-huh. see it says so Thais. I know. Tell your final thoughts, but you had to open your big mouth because I was going to sit here and I was going to go, you know, I'm really glad I had a great time on the show and I'm really thankful that Atropos was able to join us and it's been wonderful having him here because he does such, such like a great deal for the community and he's, he's always helping people out and his site has, has helped so many people, but no, you had to go and ruin it. He and just now said it. my comment, but my comments are so not even important anymore. Gosh, man. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. That's a There's a reason. <laughs> no, and, and tell people where they can find you because evidently your name fits in right now. What am I doing? At Tear Eater. <laughs> yeah, at, yes, you can in find game. me in game at Tear Eater. T E A R E A T E R. You can also find me on Twitter at Twit Queen Phase. Woohoo! The name fits you so much more day after day. <laughs> For as much as you love Argonians, who are essentially the hippies of ESO, you are a hate-filled person. I, I'm not. I was just, I'm sitting here waiting for, like, the final thoughts. Because I had, like, like this little speech I was going to say. Because you always tell me to go first. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yes, it's going to be great. I'm going to, like, be able to address them. And it's going to be awesome. And I'll say, like, my little final thing. And then you won't be able to open your mouth because I've already said it. But you, you took it from me. <laughs> I stole your thunder. You did. Like, right out from under me. When the thunder come above you, that would be like sweeping the rug out from under you. Well, either way. Semantics, and that's something you really like. (laughs) (laughs) Mr. I can't spell or speak. Yeah, once in a while I get a good one in. That's all I need. I'm good. Deltia, good sir. Um, Atropos, can you sign um, Ag's man boob, his left one? He's he's just having so much fun having you on the show today. Like He's (laughs) he's such a fanboy. You're all he could talk about, like, all week. Oh, my God. He wants, uh, like... But anyways, it was great having you on the show. I mean, a big part of the community, and I really... I think this community is just... It's something special. It really is. We're not... I, I agree. It, it, it's great. And having you on the show and being in the guild, I just... I love it. I get to see the content that I want and be a part of a team that's organized, and it's been a blast so far. So, great show. Awesome. Only you weren't AD. <laughs> 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 yeah, haters gonna hate. <laughs> what, what do you play on AD? Is it at least a Khajiit? Who me? Uh, no, no, a Tropos. He oh. plays. Um, um, my sorcerer is Imperial. Oh, oh. Imperial. All right. Okay. Well, all, all right. That means I don't have to completely hate him. It's still AD. If I wasn't an Imperial, I'd probably be an Almer. Ugh. Get on. Ugh. Gross. All right. Well, I think the. If only I wouldn't get banned for copywriting, I'd put Taylor Swift's song at the end, The Hater's Gonna Hate, just because. But I would probably get banned for that. So I don't want to be the cause of that. So. Yeah, Tropus is the cause of that. So everyone knows. So everyone, I'm not going to put any song at the end of this. Go listen to that and think of a Tropos. There you go. Oh, dear. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for listening to the podcast. Great show. I'm glad I got it. Uh, we got Tropus on. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for coming on. 
Uh, you can find me in game at Agelos, A G G E L O S. Um, personal Twitter is at Agelos underscore W O F. And uh, yeah, hit me up. I'm always chatting with people. Ask the East. She says I talk to too many people too much. I do. If you got questions, ask them. I will answer as long as I'm at my desk. Um, if you wish to help support the co- podcast, feel free to pay- or donate via the PayPal link on the website. Use the Amazon link off the site because you know you probably didn't order that gift for your mother-in-law. Trust me, I didn't either. Hope she doesn't listen. Does she? It depends. If, if-